Se que de lo bajo, se que de lo bajo, olu a mi o ti de o yo se que de lo bajo. The Ashen Forge. Hello and welcome to the Ashen Forge. I am Phantom X, joined as always by Diggs and the legendary Neurotoxin. Happy Sunday evening. How's it going? Pretty good. All right. Good. Well, another week has passed, and here we are to talk about a little Ashes of Creation. I don't know if there's anything before we get started. I know Diggs, you played some New World. Finally, I did. All kinds of dancing this past week, including, let's see, I went dancing after class Thursday night and left the club at uh, 11 o'clock p.m. And then I went dancing Friday night and left the club at 11.15 p.m. Um, and then uh, I had a late night dance class, 7 to 8 last night. Um, so I was not playing a lot of New World, but uh, finally did get in. It was nice to have my character. Um, the Diggs character was um, already on the new start fresh server. Fresh start server is what they call it. At level 22, so I was able to catch up close to Phantom fairly quickly this morning. Um, it was kind of fun. Uh, we didn't play together, but I'm ready to play together. So. Yeah. Um, I had to play a little bit more of it. I think you, we're all basically the same level at this point, 25, 26, 27, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. I still say yeah. the most fun part of it that I've had <laughs> so far is being a uh, getting a guitar out and just trying to just level that and go stand at different areas and play for people. Um, nice. It's it's really super. I'm, I kept thinking about this conversation we had about um, what is it that is lacking and why can't I stay focused on one specific MMORPG, which was Community. And I started realizing as I'm um, playing. Oh, did we go down? Yeah, it looked like it went down for a moment. Huh. Um, I think we're okay now. I yeah, think we're okay now. I think we're good now. Yeah. I don't know. Is this might be a twitch then because my mm -hmm. i'm on a gig fiber so don't know what that's about um but yeah i was saying so i, I love that sort of stuff that that I, I will sit and play songs and people just start they stop and they do their dance emotes and then they tip you but when i go out to like fight i still i see someone going the same area and i'm like get the hell out of, I'm, i don't i don't want to mess with you why are you here go somewhere else i want i want that or i mm -hmm. want the uh <laughs> i want to harvest um, so there's like these competing, uh, ideals. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, well, the way you broached it was a little confusing because, uh, harvesting is competing, but I like going out for, um, and running into people when I'm, uh, you know, fighting mobs and we just fight stuff together a couple of times. I was about to hit a boss mm -hmm. and somebody else showed up and I was like, Oh, Hey, let's, do it together um yeah and it's one of the things i like about world of warcraft is running into people and just fighting together even when i don't know them i don't have to be in a group we can just take down the threats uh together but it's a lot better when you're able to uh buff other people like that that was the most fun back in the day when you could just um you know, tag people as they run by you and give them a buff. Um, when you could give people um, Spirit of the Wind and... Um, wolf. Spirit of the Wolf, yeah. Um, so, yeah, just uh, um, being able to play the guitar and give people a buff and interact with them and they'll dance with you. I mean, that totally sounds like fun. I kept getting... Um, so... Uh, since I haven't played in so long, I think my other character that I was playing mostly, my main character in New World is level 46 um, and been all over the place. Um, 
The Diggs avatar stopped around 22 and I haven't played probably in a year, year and a half. Um, so this time I get kept getting distracted by the, um, I forget what they call them, but the fast travel spots, um, they show up on the map that you haven't activated them yet. So mm -hmm. um, I'm supposed to be going to hand in a quest, but I'm like, oh, I could activate that fast travel spot mm -hmm. over there. I'm going to run over there on the map. Oh, there's a place I haven't been. There's a question mark there. I'm going to go find what that POI is. Let me go run over there. And I mean, I think that's going to be similar to Ashes of Creation where... Uh, you don't have a mount, and you have to kind of run everywhere. And well, but we have those fast travel spots for when you do want to fast travel. So, I mean, I don't mind spending a lot of time in New World, running around um, or just running. Um, but I'm not trying to meet up with specific people. Um, and I guess if I didn't want to meet up with specific people, I know that I could use the fast travel spots. You know, my concern about um, having to run everywhere is when you have these parties. I mean, that was one of the things that I loved about um, Landmark is uh, we have all kinds of parties or whatever, and sometimes the devs would pop in and you're like trying to get to that place as fast as you can so you can, you know, party with people. And if you literally have to run all the way across the map for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then the party's over by the time you get there or the devs have left by the time you get there. Well, you know, that's no fun. Um, but uh, yeah, just jumping in and doing some new world stuff. I think the, um, uh, since I didn't start from scratch, I didn't notice a lot of difference with the quests, but uh, some difference. I did notice some difference. So, you know, it was fun for a little bit I played this morning. Gotcha. Well, um, I think we had thought about going over some of the lore. We didn't really get to go over the Tower of Carfin last week, um, which was from some pretty interesting lore. There was there's a big piece to it. Actually, I want to before I get to that, there's a piece that I'm confused about um, <clears throat> when it comes to the use of blood magic. But within you mentioned travel. Um, I'm curious because, yes, we all know there is no fast travel or there's limited fast travel in Ashes of Creation. Um, I can manage that. I actually think when I look back, EverQuest probably had some of the best blend of porting and kind of longer travel. But um, going to the lore, actually, when we talk about I was reading through and the Tower of Carfin, there's actually one of the levels that they discussed used to have a teleport nexus that was obviously, I think, sort of ruined um, during the apocalypse and everything that, that came from the Harbingers. But that makes me wonder, it's like, OK, well, if we have no fast travel at the beginning, there's in a series of established, established uh, teleport nexus located presumably throughout the world does that get to be an expansion later on do we um get to have some limited fast travel as things or is that more uh, uh, is that lore just tied into the specific types of metropolises um, as well so well and some of that um, in terms of PvP, I would hope that might be driving some of the meaningful PvP, whether or not, you know, how much fast travel do you want in the world? And um, does that mean that you're going to try to destroy those metropolises that achieve um, the fast travel um, boons? Uh, and then in the case of Tower of Carfin, do you... PvP, the people that are going through there, maybe there's people who want to, you know, do that dungeon in order to uh, reconnect or somehow connect the fast travel um, portals there. And so you're fighting them not because you want to stop them from defeating the boss or getting the, you know, you want to get their loot or whatever, but you are really anti-travel and that's an incentive for you to fight. Um, I'm hoping we see things like that rather than just, you know, I want to do uh, full loot and, you know, 
Well, so it was tea bag you afterwards. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, so it's the fourth floor uh, of that tower. And also one of the statues was uh, Jenica was one of the deans they mentioned was also taught teleportation. So while we are limited in it now, there clearly is a history of what appears to have been extensive teleportation. And maybe that's just an out later on. Well, didn't they fail? Didn't uh, they fail to do the teleportation? Are you talking about the final attempt to save their people? Yeah, the, well, the, I'm just thinking the more broad one, I think they're the one of the deans uh, that is going to be one of the bosses mm -hmm. is the one that tried to teleport and failed. And then we'll, you know, yep. be fighting their, you know, failed teleport state. So it makes me wonder if they didn't actually have that technology or they didn't have it mastered well enough to the point where there was a, a rate of failure possible. I don't know, but in these teleport, the teleport nexus existed. Maybe we can bring it back. Um, and actually, I had even a, another idea. Again, I, I could see where maybe that would tie into some of the metropolis. Uh, which is it that actually has a form of... Am I making that up in my head? Wasn't science? There? It's science. I think it's science. Yeah, science yeah. specifically is the one where mm. I guess across its entire uh, sphere of influence, mm -hmm. um, all of its vassals and their vassals and their vassals and their vassals um, all have access to... Now, I'm not sure if it's two-way teleportation or if it's a... You can go from the metropolis itself straight to anywhere, but then you still got to run back sort of thing. That's a good question. Because mm -hmm. the um, it was a university, right? That's the the tower was that sort of seat of science, knowledge and power. Yeah. So maybe that it would be a science node for sure. Yeah, it makes sense that maybe what this floor represented was just what we already know. Which would make the Tower of Carfin a stage, what node? Stay, what sticks, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So another question that comes to mind, and I doubt this is the case, but um, I think part of what was explained in the forums, uh, more so than in the stream afterwards, there was a forum post that this event triggers when any node within Riverlands reaches a stage three, as long as there's not something else already occurring from a story arc perspective that would prevent this one from starting. So something that's uh, a conflict. But that makes me wonder, okay, if this starts at node three or a stage three node, um, would the story ever, uh, and we know there's environmental change throughout this entire process, well, this would have been, these this tower, these ruins, would have been a stage six. Um, no. When when Carfin was a city way back before the apocalypse, yes, the, yes. the region in which the tower of Carfin and I guess the city of Carfin or mm -hmm. whatever, that would that region would have been mm -hmm. a a tier six. So if the point of interest itself, of course, is, you know, it's it's a place in the world that we access. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm going out with this, we can. yeah, is, um, well, what if by triggering this when you're the, the node is stage three, can you create a storyline that this then becomes your metop metropolis, right? That this tower is eventually somehow restored through environment change and becomes a, a part of the node over time uh, becomes much more useful. Uh, that would be interesting. But then when it has its, uh, uh oh, it's blood time moments. Um, well, yeah, that 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 would be an issue. Gets back to that understanding completely how they're going to redo these story elements um, repeating over time. I don't know, just a thought. If it's triggered at a lower stage and we know that it would have been a higher stage, is there at all, uh, any way to get back to bringing it alive, basically? Fully purging out the evil and restoring it, that'd be, that'd be pretty interesting. 
Uh, I don't know if they'll let us do that, but I'd like to. Yeah, I wonder how the um, ZOIs will overlap because uh, there could be several. I think there could probably be several different science metros that could cover that same area once they reach metro size. Um, so that could be interesting, too. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, I mean, just if, if this area never triggers this story, then it doesn't become a cleaned up place where you can go read books off shelves like um, in Ultima Online, as Ambo has mentioned way back when. That was the other thing is that it specifically he talks about the lore of having a lot of books. It'd be really interesting to actually be able to sit in there and just read. Um, while that, that would be it. That's how you would do the PVP thing. You wait until the node gets up to tier three and then you um, set up roots in the next place over and knock it down to make sure you can, you know, bring that place up. And then when it happens again, you go to the next place in a different, you know, adjacent direction and set down your roots and do the same thing and basically build up in such a way that it can never get above like a tier two or something. And it's just like, nope, no one gets Carfin now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You take a big effort to undo all of that. Yeah, there, there's another point that that I could I need some help in understanding, which we probably won't know for a little bit until we actually start Alpha uh, Two or release, probably more likely. Um, the story that was presented was what was her name? Um, was it Laria Lamont? Was the headmistress at the time of the apocalypse and had been conversing with someone unknown to her that taught her this blood magic. And that is how they, uh, was it, um, I forget the guy's name. It's a really weird name. Um, that became the sacrifice of Eric. And uh, where I'm having some trouble connecting the dots is that what has been said was that this voice was trying to teach her a way to give the city more time, or at least that's how I've interpreted it, so that they could, you know, get their people away, that they were in charge of trying to buy extra time while and hold off the uh, harbingers from coming. But that it was an ancient that told her how to do this, and it was the same ancient that told King Atrax how to uh, become, to you know, basically be immortal and raise undead, which makes sense that they're both undead uh, beings that are where I'm where I'm having trouble connecting the dots is that why would the ancient that why would they allow them to have time? Like, why would they help buy time? That's where I'm, the lore starts to break down a little bit for me, unless the goal was. Oh, no, it's not that they're trying to help them buy time. It's. Let me give you this offer, and in exchange, you're going to make a, a deal that benefits us way more. And, you know, you're going to try to do something in the short term that may or may not work, but it's going to give us much more, you know, ground in this area for the long term. So that's that's probably more what I would expect the angle was. Yeah, I guess when I've read and listened, it didn't come across as knowing that, that that the person, the character was under the impression they were trying to save as many people as they could. Of course, I guess the angle of the ancient could have been just to produce undead. Uh, so discord or corruption, whatever. But it seemed odd that it'd be the same person trying to help because it worked, right? That it, it act, And that's what threw me off a little bit is that they had to build... Uh, bridges over the river because they were the the magic worked in st in stopping them from approaching as quickly as they could. I don't know. Just seems weird. Well, the ancients were interested in immortality, which also led to the undead, I believe. So they were pure. There would be some, what do you mean by pure? Um, they were sort of the opposite of King Atrex. He produced undead. They were more pure and they're not, not undead uh, in the way the mobs are. That's my understanding of it, that they were more pure in their essence. 
you mean that they didn't have corruption? I guess, yeah. That it, it did not. Their outcomes were not the same as Keen uh, Atrax. Atrax. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't have similar interests, right? They're both. It's it's just one has a more deleterious effect, but they're still kind of trying for the same goal, right? Well, I mean, they're already immortal. I don't. I think what ended up corrupting the ancients is that they were looking for Im immortality. Now I'll go back to the story. I'm pretty sure they they the um, others gave it to them, and then there was a battle, and then they were put into the void, and uh, they mm. they then taught uh, King Atrax how to become immortal because they already knew it themselves but they told him in a perverted way so that he became undead um, versus they were not they would not be considered mm -hmm. undead mm, okay i don't know this is just a, but um you know you mentioned do we fight the the portal person um i didn't realize and i'll have to i don't know where this was it's on the wiki but there actually is a rendering for this this lamont character that that's already been rendered so i assume that is probably who the final boss of the tower is. Um, yeah. Or maybe one of two. I guess you could fight in two different locations. So maybe one location's her and another location something else. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's the impression I got, that it's a different boss at the bottom. <laughs> Around the outside or whatever. So. A lot of fun, uh, fun lore uh, that keeps slowly yes. trickling out. Uh, but I don't know if y'all had anything else. I, I did want to touch on those those points from last week that we missed. I don't know if there's anything else that comes to mind for you all for the lore. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, mostly that. Um... I'm interested in seeing a lot more, you know, during actual gameplay of all of the different engravings and stuff on all the walls and all the uh, all the stuff that's going to be depicted throughout. It would be a little disappointing if they basically showed us all the assets that, that there are to see and they're just going to be repeated throughout the place. I don't really think that's going to be the case with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little concerned that the blood magic seems to be inherently evil um and uh i would prefer for there to be different uses since you know it's kind of moving down this track of voodoo being inherently evil um which is really a perception thing um rather than an inherent thing but We'll have to see how ne necromancy actually works, fashions of creation, and if there is a more positive form of it, even using blood magic. Right. It's it's one of the questions that I've kind of had with the uh, blood magic versions of items you can harvest. Are they exclusively going to make items that will use blood magic in a corrupting way or is there a way to utilize them in a way that is uh you know restorative and reduces the uh corruption um you know in in one form or another or mm -hmm. maybe is simply neutral and doesn't have you know it doesn't add the corruption because it's been done properly and with the proper respect and such yeah Especially when know. we're like using everything else about the animals, we can use their fur and their bones and their teeth, and we're harvesting all other stuff. But if you use blood, woo! <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, do that. that's right. Mix it with some like rice and bread crumbs, and put it in some uh, uh, some sausage stuffing, and cook it up. It's blood sausage. Mm -hmm. you no, know, whatever. Yes, we need to know more if about you're out of eggs, you can replace it with a certain amount of blood, apparently, though uh, you might not like how it tastes. Or maybe you do, if you grew up on or it. Or maybe you do. Maybe there's some um, cook cooking recipes within the tower that 
let us create some sort of uh, blood muffins or <laughs> uh, something like that. Blood pudding. Yeah. Hmm. Um. All right. Well, that's that was the lore from uh, last week. So I do want to go over. Uh, we've not touched on the um, dev discussion, and I know Diggs, you had wanted to to talk about this a little bit. So the last dev discussion that came up was on dungeon delving, and the specific question that was asked uh, was, on average, how long do you prefer a dungeon playthrough to take? And um, that seems to be like a complex answer, uh, since really it should start with what type of dungeon is it to begin with. But anyways, um, I know you right. had some thoughts. Well, um, I, and I didn't really have any thoughts about length, because I don't think about that when I go through a dungeon. Well, but my play sessions tend to be fairly long, so my play sessions tend to be two to three hours at least. Um so I kind of have time to go through a dungeon for longer than 90 minutes. Um, but uh, sometimes, like in my conception of the way I would hope dungeons work in Ashes of Creation is that you aren't always trying to finish them in one session. I think it should be okay to do parts and leave and come back. I think sometimes you should um, kind of be pushed to leave because you don't have what you need to finish it and you kind of have to go maybe gain a couple more levels get some more resources and come back to try and finish it so you do a part of it leave and come back um so in terms of uh of length i think there should be variable lengths and it depends on how much of the dungeon you're trying to complete and then of course how many people you have with you um but the main thing i wanted to mention um, about dungeons today is uh playing new worlds this morning they changed i think one of the uh quests for creating the uh azoth staff you have to go and get a few pieces of it and put that together and i don't remember going through when i played it previously uh going through in the first part i had to drop down uh a shaft in the dungeon and avoid these beams that would have injured me if the beams had hit me i had they were timed so that you would try and go through the space when they weren't um active and uh but then there were places where I had to actually hit the crawl button and crawl through the dungeon. It's my very first literal dungeon crawl in an MOR, MMORPG or even, I think, any online RPG. So we've had jumping puzzles before, but I've never had crawling puzzles in an online RPG before. And that was awesome because it made me feel like I was literally doing a dungeon crawl in a Dungeons and Dragons tabletop game. So I hope they include those. I hope we see that in more MMORPGs, fantasy MMORPGs that have dungeons. Um, not just things that make us jump like uh, those uh, action games from 30 years ago, but uh, also actually include some um, crawling and climbing. Yeah, there's so. definitely been more noticeable movement parts to completing quests and getting places you needed to be. Um, you know, before you could just sort of, it's one of those things you just keep climbing, jump, climb, jump, climb. And it, it clearly became more complicated in reaching higher areas or lower areas. Um, which I never thought I'd say I was one for jumping type puzzles in an MMORPG, but it actually kind of breaks up some of the monotony of run from point A to B. It's like, oh, shit, I got to figure out how to get to point B. OK. Um, yeah, and I like what I, I think one of the things I liked about it is when I played it before, I'm pretty sure I had to kill a bunch of stuff to get to the end. And I don't think I had to kill anything. I just had to move through uh, uh, the dungeon and find the right spot and get to the right spot um, once I got into that little dungeon area. I mean, that's a solo dungeon, kind of. Um, 
I mean, I think there was one point at the end where you had to f- fight a bunch of people right at the end. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, for the most part, it was literally what do you need to do to get there? Some of it involves crawling. It was, I mean, you know, because you have this crawl um, mm-hmm. button that you can use, but there's almost never a reason to use it. I mean, it's kind of a fun little emote to do, but um, to actually have it useful in one of your quests is kind of awesome. It's a good point. I've actually, I've gotten in the habit of watching. Well, it's not a bunch. It's one specific Daisy streamer. It's running, running man Z uh, on you on YouTube. And um, there's a lot of, in that PVP translation of laying down, sitting, laying flat on your back, on your belly, uh, trying to reduce you know, your ability to be targeted or hit or whatever it might be. Uh, stuff that you just don't see um, in MMORPGs. Um, of course, we're, I guess we're not really using a large ranged fighting apparatuses anyways, but like guns. But uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nero, any thoughts on dungeon delving? Yeah, I wrote a giant post. <laughs> <laughs> that's I did. what would be expected um, it was uh, kind of talking about is it the size of the POI that dictates the length or is it the tier that you're playing it at that should dictate the length um, considering about where the time is going how much of it is travel how much is rest how much is combat how much is exploration and discovery of the area um and how those things could increase or decrease the length of a place um whether it's linear or multifaceted whether it's something where you're basically going straight in and straight out or it's like a loop where you go all the way through and then it kind of spits you back out of the entrance exit again um you know, or something where you're going to go through a few different areas, a few different ways, see different stuff, clear different stuff. Maybe you get a quest to double back to a different area to access something in return. You know, something like that. Um, getting different sets of keys that are kind of imprinted to you where you can open re- and reopen certain doorways and go back through them so you can you know, go back to the fifth floor, you know, when you want to and stuff like that. Uh, Yeah, that's uh, that's the sort of stuff that, um, you know, you can make it a much longer encounter if you have it a lot more like back and forth to like a common hub sort of thing or places that loop back on each other in different ways. So you can always kind of take a break and leave and come back sort of thing. Uh, otherwise, you know, if it's going to be a straight shot sort of thing, um, I would hope it wouldn't take any more than two hours for the longest sort of things. Yeah. And then another question is, you know, any group or my group, because you talk about the length for a group. Well, the group that I want to be playing with might be scattered all across, you know, the next seven regions over in various directions. And so by the time we actually even assemble, you know, hour, two hours, maybe you've gone by, maybe more. Um, don't have all of our supplies kind of out of place or whatever. Um that uh or maybe maybe you do get to do a little quick supply run before you go out but that's going to extend the length that's basically well you got to do a session just to get to the place you're going to do the thing and then you can have another session later to do the thing hopefully it's not a time limited thing that you're not going to have a chance to do the next time you're all ready to play together and so it's you know any group or my group is that going to be one of the things that drives uh pickup groups it's just not having everybody's specific friends online around in the same area at the same time. And it's just, well, we're a bunch of stragglers that want to do this thing. Hey, we're one of each different kind of class, kind of, sort of. Uh, I think we can mostly do most of the things in here. 
Yeah, I think the thing probably because, you know, maybe I have ADHD. I don't know. Um, thing I hate most about raids is hanging around waiting for people to show up and then people show up and then they have somebody has to go eat dinner. And so you have to wait for the next person to come and do their thing. And you're just sitting there doing nothing. And I'd rather be because I'm an explorer first. So I don't want to be sitting around in one place doing nothing. I'd rather be out exploring and finding stuff to do. Um, and, you know, that fifth time that the kid has to go eat dinner <laughs> after waiting for them for 40 minutes, you know, that's like, yeah, I'd, I'd just rather not go do something else that I can actually do. Um, Sounds like you've had some bad experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of them back in the day. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope again, it's a situation. And it was kind of, I think, um, I see that written in Nero's post too. Um, I would hope that it would be multifaceted and, uh, some parts you can do in 15 minutes if you want to stay. And, um, I think in some ways though, it should never be kind of a sense of necessarily defeating the dungeon. Like, uh, okay, I killed the big boss. And so once you do that, um, if you go back, it's going to be rerunning the same thing. Um, I hope you defeat the big boss and the next time you decide to come back, somebody else is there. So it's not exactly the same thing. And maybe they've reset the puzzles so that the puzzles aren't exactly the same either. Um, so that you're not really, you're right. It's not a sense of it took two hours to do it you went through and did whatever you did and then you come back and spend however much time you want to spend there i don't know what well, yeah and i agree so so this there's well first is sort of what type of dungeon are they talking about right because so uh, you know when i think of traditional dungeons it's like one of two ways i'm used to the everquest model where you're just you're parking your party in a camp spot and you're just killing things as they spawn or uh, the World of Warcraft version, and you're just in a 20 minute dungeon and nobody talks to each other. The goal is to just rush through it. There's usually three bosses, maybe five. And, you know, the five ones take maybe 10 minutes longer. Um, you know, and if, if one person dies, everyone gets frustrated and quits because what should have taken 15 minutes is going to take far too long. But when I think of, I think of that as uh, never winter online because that's when I first encountered that. So I first encountered that right around ten years ago, 2012, 2013. Um, prior to that, I did not experience that in World of Warcraft. Um, you know that rush we got to rush through, and one person dies, and everybody. Yeah, but even uh, yeah, and and quit. that's one way. To look at it. But even then. What, but even then, World of Warcraft, like there's a, it's a timed goal, right? You you have a pretty straightforward goal. You have a boss at the end of the dungeon, and that's that's your goal. When I when I think of Ashes, this is why this confu this question kind of confuses me. Is I guess I've never envisioned their open world dungeons as a playthrough, like it, you both are kind of mentioning. Like why why are you asking how long I would want to play through? You know, there's only one boss. I'm not. You know, I, my idea would have been just to go out and wing a and maybe never make it over to wing b which is where the final boss is I, i've never even considered the idea of what is an adequate time in a dungeon like this that's open world uh, my if i'm going to ask a time question or i'm going to answer a time question it's going to be more about how long does it take to get to the dungeon because then i don't have as much time in the dungeon like once i'm there you know However much time I play is however much time I have. Uh, that could be 30 okay. minutes. That could be an hour. There's not sort of a in an open world dungeon. Um, and so that that's the question's strange to me because I've never considered, you know, I, I, I've never thought of it as though every group that goes to the to an Ashes of Creation dungeon has the same goal of, of completing a playthrough. Because I guess I've just never pictured it that way. Like with, with Tower of Carfin, like... There are multiple different levels. Maybe you and I go and we go to level three and we, we never see that boss, but we have plenty to do. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that kind of reminds me too of some anime where you have this tower and you just keep going higher and higher and higher. I mean, they have 21 levels or more in those. And um, and actually, they spend, right, you have to be a certain level before you can even reach uh, the higher tiers. Um, so you're returning there a bunch of times, but, um, you know, it takes months probably in, in oh. the anime it takes months or years for them to get to the top um and i was thinking yeah I, does it need a big boss I mean, you just need bosses that are challenging enough that you feel like you accomplish something i don't know that it has to be just one big boss it could be five you know big bosses that give you enough challenge that you're like okay you know we did something today we're going to come back uh next week and we'll do a different boss or maybe we'll do two different ones but it's not necessarily the big boss it's just you know big enough that mm -hmm. you feel like you had an adequate accomplishment so i don't know yeah, it's it's a, a good point about different levels within. The, I, I again, I think of EverQuest. I, I know exactly what comes to mind when I think of travel in this sort of um, open uh, dungeon world. Is the Dreadlands? There was a a druid port. I was a druid. You'd port in one zone over, um, pretty quick run to the zone line. You cross into the Dreadlands. So that it took five five minutes, maybe ten minutes to run from the porting area across one zone to Carnos Castle. Um, KC, which is where I spent a lot of time. I think it's like in the 40s. But the zone there, you you know, you zone in, and it certainly is a large zone. But I never saw a lot of it because you know that the there are different level requirements. Well, when I say requirements, different difficulties. If you were right at the beginning of that zone, if you were in the middle of that zone, if you were in the top floor of that zone, you know, very clear cut differences where maybe I could do just fine in a group at the very beginning of that zone, that dungeon, <clears throat> but in no way could I handle anything past the first gate, um, which you just don't see anymore, uh, but I think is actually a really good design of keeping people interested of extending the life of a zone when you start throwing this, uh, the run to this area, running through Dreadlands, I had to dodge things that were higher level than me just to get, you know, get where I was going. Um, but I could also find areas within that zone where I could solo camp. So, you know, the, the design like that just doesn't, and that's sort of how I pictured Ashes was that you would have these large open world uh, dungeons where people, you would go back to this idea of camps. Um, you know, people would set up camps in different areas and you'd, you'd see the out at the shouts for, you know, one player at, you know, um, I don't know, uh, level three, um, you know, back at the back reading section of the library or something. I don't know. Well, that is what I have to say on dungeon delving. Um, we got about 15 more minutes to burn. Um, you know, surprisingly, a lot of the questions, the Q&A from the last stream kind of lined up pretty well with the community Q&A. So we actually have already touched on a lot of them. Uh, things like, you know, viable, minimal viable product for release. And are you going to upgrade the engines? Um, can, you know, how often I will point out that in the community, there's a distinct difference in how Steven answered. He answers it the same, but how he answers it was different in the community Q and a, cause we kind of laughed about this after the, we did our show on the community Q and a, like when they ask him, are you done with unreal upgrades? Like, Oh no, no, no. It's just like, he kind of chuckles like, no, we're no way. Like we got more to do. When you listen to this Q and a, it's sort of a very, it's a much more contained, well, there's probably some things that we'll have to do and just very different approaches to how he answered the question, which I thought was interesting. But um, hmm. um, so um, I don't know if you had a chance to look through that Q&A. There's nothing that really popped out at me that we would really want to go over that we haven't already. So hmm. uh, in the absence of anyone having anything to say, I actually was going to pull some questions from the forums that they like we do before shows. Yeah. Um, one of them that has been, I've actually got in some discussion on the forums about, which was interesting, um, was this idea now that AI is becoming so big, chat GTP, uh, GPT, 
the audio component, there has been s several discussions and there is now a question on whether um, Intrepid would utilize AI voice acting um, anytime, if there are any plans to get into that area. Uh, my initial response to this question on the forums was, why are you even asking this? We don't have a game yet. Like, why would you even bother with spending the time? But I kind of worked my way through this thread and understanding a little bit better, you know, that maybe that it's not just them working on it. You know, they can utilize somebody else's work. There's some pretty interesting scenarios that can come out of that. Um, and the one that sort of turned me more in favor of having this discussion was just the simple idea of walking down a street and setting and having a uh, NPC that's selling items that I no longer have to click on them, right click, look at their inventory, choose between buy or sell, but I'm actually walking down the street and there's someone speaking to me. Hey, I have this at this price. I have this at that price. Um, So-and-so just sold me this. Like that's actually a kind of a neat idea. Okay, I got to say, that's got a little bit of the don't make an AI game with doors and drawers people can't open because that pisses them off because in VR you want to be able to open doors and drawers. Uh, it, it's that if I meet a busker on the street, you know, trying to sell their wares, I immediately want to haggle with them. And I don't know if the game's going to allow that because that's a, that's the first thing, you know, you know, OK, can I get a deal? You know, is there something I've got that you're interested in? You know, doing doing a little bit of this, a little of that. You know, I don't know. This armor doesn't really seem like it's my fi my fit here. Uh, you know, can I try it on first? You know, this sort of stuff. Yeah, no mind tricks, only money. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 the one thing I like it. I like the idea of having it. But instinctually, I'm going to want to haggle with them and, you know, start talking about, it. Like, oh, hey, you got this and that. You know, can I get these things together? Uh, can you knock off uh, uh, 10 gold off the price? No, I'm not so going to kill a roaming vendor to get a free sword. <laughs> unless it's a quest because the vendor's corrupt. Uh, someone said uh, in this one um, thread that uh, the AI voice for World of Warcraft is really good, um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I'd be concerned about um, scope creep. Um, I'm wondering how easy it is to implement at the level that uh, Phantom just mentioned. Uh, because uh, it seems like uh, it could be a viable solution to the fact that Intrepid does not want to have uh, voiced dialogue um, in the game because it's too expensive with actors. Um, so if it's just at the level that we're kind of used to where the devs have, um, uh, you know, generated static dialogue, um, then... That could be great. I'm not sure about um, that dialogue changing and how well AI could do that, which is a little bit of what I heard from Phantom. I'm not sure that he meant it that way, like um, um, procedurally generated um, dialogue coming from the AI. I don't know. If that seems a little way too far fetched. But um, yeah, it would be interesting if it's easy to uh, implement. Um, I'm curious to see what that would be like, but you know, hmm. when is the game going to come out at that point? There's just so many cool instances. Like uh, I, go ahead. It, you know, if if the actual like design and development of the tools is simple and streamlined enough that it's not actually hard to integrate into an Unreal project. Uh, I don't know that it's actually going to be that much feature creep and that much work to make it happen. And you don't have to tie quests to all this. I mean, imagine walking into a, a, a tavern setting now and being able just to have random conversations 
you know, within some set limits, but you know, it's not like you're talking to a quest giver that they, they then have to tie in a whole lot of other stuff. It could just be a simple, how much different the world would feel. Or if you were in a uh, siege and you lost and you're, you know, you lost that metropolis and now you go venturing through some of the lower nodes and they know that you lost and you're walking down the street and you hear, hey, there's that asshole. He, he's the reason we don't have the money we used to have. He lost the fight. He lost the fight, you know, fight. Like that would just be such a different game to play in. Uh, it would be a lot of fun. Well, of course, because it's at least one step closer to story bricks. But my concern is that it's somewhat similar and maybe too similar to story bricks. But that being said, I wonder how much easier story bricks might be to accomplish at this point with this level of AI that we're seeing in the past year or so. So, yeah, I don't know. It, a lot of it depends on how easy it is. I guess we might expect to see it because the game is unlikely to release before, you know, 2027, 20, 28. And by that time, they'll be at uh, Unreal Engine 6. And that will probably have this AI in there already. So the Unreal Engine guys will have figured it out and it'll be fairly, um, you know, it's not something that Intrepid has to figure out. It's something that the Unreal Engine will probably have in it. But that's just one of those, in my mind, when we talk about what could actually move forward the, the, the genre, like make it truly different. Um, I, I started playing on the weekend. There's a game, it's Mad World uh, MMO, um, which is a browser base. Actually, there'll, there'll be a client based on Steam as well, but it, early access started. It's a fine game. It, the art's okay. It's more of a horror to approach. Um, the first character I paired up with that you get bonded in this nice relationship gets her head cut off in like five minutes into the game. But anyways, um, but there's nothing like moving it forward. There's nothing different. It's a different world. It's a different story. You know, but at some point there's a there's tons of stories. You know, if you don't have an IP that's well established, it's kind of hard to just build interest off of the the lore component. So that's where we talk about a meow. But I think this is another, not just the world, but actually having characters within the world that can address you um, and talk to you in various different ways based off what you've done, what your skills are. It'd just be really, really, I think another way to move the the genre forward. But yeah, again, you know, if we could get story bricks, that would be awesome. So the closer to story bricks we can get, awesome. Uh, there's another uh, thread that I was participating in, and there's a question asked about this. The question was, will we have items that let us resurrect other players? Um, and it's sort of in the, the conversation for us is, I think, too. One is that whether, you know, do you think there should be items that allow players to resurrect other players or should that just be tied to a skill of a class? Um, the thread that I was in was actually more of should resurrection be allowed during combat? Um, uh, else? I would say the context is probably very important if it's like. Uh, a war or a siege or you know some some sanctioned formal sort of battle uh i could see potentially having an item that you expend resources from your war cash on essentially to be able to outfit your your troops with um it wouldn't be an unlimited sort of thing Maybe it's something that your enemies can pick up off of you and that they can use, or you can pick them up off of them. Um, but it would be limited to that battle um, or battles of that sort. Um, other than that, yeah, I think if an item like that is going to exist, it would probably be an out of combat sort of thing and it might still require it being administered by somebody who has a certain sort of skill or proficiency I guess it would depend on how far away your respawn points are right uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I would prefer there to not be an item because, again, I, I really would like to see classes have specific functions. And if you have certain classes that they are known because they can resurrect, then why take that away and put exactly. that on an item to where you no longer really need that class for much of anything? Um, exactly. You know, I, I think um, if that's the only thing a class is good for, that's kind of limited. But it's an important part. For a cleric. Yeah, I don't know why it would be the only. It's just one of the utilities that a big utility. You have. You know, that's why um, when you see healing pots, they they really pale in comparison to actual heals. And the reason is you don't I think is that you don't want to reduce the need for a cleric by introducing an item that does just the same. So that so in my mind the resurrection stone would be equivalent to that. But I think where it really concerns me as I just try and contemplate what it would be like in the game, the area that really concerns me is um, caravans. Like, it shouldn't be easy to resurrect people during caravan raids. No, I think. It's a question. Should there be a difference PvE versus PvP? Well, does the uh, caravan act as the respawn point for them? Or do they go to the next closest respawn point? I don't point. think the caravan would be the respawn point. And part of the um, challenge of caravans is that you're not supposed to be able to zerg. Um, so I would think that you sure. would not want to have people resurrecting very quickly you'd want that you know if you at least to get uh respawned at some point and then have to run back some mm -hmm. distance um rather than you know all of your people could be resurrected quite quickly because everybody brought a bunch of resurrection potions or whatever i i, I think especially for a caravan that would be my concern and I think for a siege, you're probably going to respawn fairly close to the siege, that it's not going to matter too much whether you get resurrected or respawned. At least when I played sieges, I didn't care necessarily, you know, that I had to go back to a respawn point. I don't think there would have been a need for somebody to resurrect me. Um, so. Yeah, I guess you don't I think really. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Keep it with the with the with the primary archetype i don't i don't mind the idea of resurrecting during combat um i don't because um you know if 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 you're already losing right to a point where you're having people die um to resurrect them it usually is going to be a long spell and it's usually going to be a spell that costs quite a bit of mana so it's going to be a resource uh sink to be able to resurrect someone so, because I think the concern, well, if you're in the middle of a battle, you know, you can just pop them right up and, you know, that would be kind of unfair. It's like, well, no, there's there's another component to this where it's going to cost mana and time. And in that time, maybe someone else dies because the healer is instead of focusing on healing other people, they're trying to bring you back to life. So I also, from a lore perspective, have never understood why um, they've never allowed it during battle like what is it that prevents a cleric from healing or uh resurrecting one way or the other but uh i don't know i would hate to see as to the stone yeah I, I really just would not like to see items taking the place of other class skills you know especially when we're not going to have utility classes um i know we have the bard but outside of that you're not having the enchanter you're not having you know an illusionist from everquest 2 uh, some of these other things that that you would have found um, in other past games, even sort of the traditional druid, um, you know, you had druid and shaman, which were really utility. Now, they could also do damage and they could heal, but but, you know, you had utility in them. You don't you don't really see that anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, in the in the absence of classes actually having specific utilities, I'd hate to see them take other things and put them on items even more. Harridan says that in World of Warcraft, yeah. priests and druids could res, but only druid could res during battle. And I think... Uh, Be res. I typically res. played a druid. Mm -hmm. But that was limited though, right? You could only do it like once and then you had a cooldown of 
like an hour or something. I thought it was a pretty long oh, pull down. Uh, but it, I mean, that's a good point though. Cause even in those instances, I can remember on raids, you know, the question is, well, should we raise them? Like what should we, do we need to burn it? Like, are we going to, are we going to survive? Or are we going to, do you want to keep the battle res? Do you, you know, um, because you, it's not free. There's a cost to it. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I could see your point with things like um, um, caravans, where that might be a little bit different. So, well, we are at nine o'clock. Is there anything else that y'all wanted to talk about this week? No, I'm uh, kind of waiting to see the uh, the next live stream and what we can uh, learn from that. Okay. I did pose the question again of whether crafting experience can reduce corruption or whether or not it is just pure combat experience that reduces corruption. Um, I don't know if I brought this up. So after the last dev stream, I actually was rather than given the answer or told not to ask more than one question like I've had been before. Um, was given the response of we were going to get to your question and we ran out of time. So ask it again. Oh, uh, OK. So we'll see. Okay. Um, that makes me think the answer is no. But, um, you know, it is an answer that I've not seen to uh, seen or it's a question I've not seen answered anywhere. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, everyone have a great rest of the evening or night, wherever you are. And um, yeah, live stream is on Friday. We will be back on Sunday. Are we hoping to do um, the uh, PAX Day one around the 8th of May? If I can get everything together, we will start to look at setting up a time. Yes, we are going to try to make uh, add in a show. For those of you who have been all around... Right. For a while, we used to alternate between uh, Chronicles of Illyria and Ashes of Creation. And then obviously we <laughs> gave up the COE show when COE went away for a little while. So um, with Ashes being so far away and with PAX Day being really pretty fun looking game that the alpha testing is going to start potentially in May, um, we thought, well, we'll add a show. Um, Lethality is, I think, going to be joining us as well. So we will have a fourth again. So, all right. Um, well, everyone have a great week, and we'll see you here next Sunday. See you later, everybody. Take care.